good afternoon, everybody. When I was sitting here listening to the statements that have been uh, going before me, I started writing what I wanted to present in the sense of um, the global gains from the reunification of Europe and what threats are posed by changes since the reunification of Europe. And if I may start my story backwards, slightly less than 50 days ago, I was in the General Assembly Hall of the United Nations in New York on the 24th of September during the high-level political forum. And at this event, traditionally, the first two statements are by the President of Brazil and the President of the United States of America. The first statement, in a nutshell, was a statement to the world that Amazon is not common property. Brazilian Amazon belongs to Brazil, and the rest of you keep your designs about how to save the Amazon to yourselves. The second statement included almost word for word the statement that this from the president of the USA. The best way you can serve humanity is to mind your own business. If you are to be good for the world, just be good for your country. And I thought it represented a very significant distance since the 9th of November 1989. And that how far have we come since those days when we celebrated our common humanity, when those of us who had very little to do with the pain which had been suffered in Eastern Europe, in East Germany, who had only been seeing on television the masses of humanity crashing across the border from Slovakia into East Germany, the half a million people standing by the wall in East Germany and demanding the right to cross to the West and we're celebrating like it's a shared victory for all of us. How, what has happened to the distance since then? I think looking at that distance of 30 years is critical to understanding what challenges we face today. A number of things are overriding. To me, the main positive since 1989 is twofold. As an African, the tendency of Western governments to shield dictators and petty criminals in high office from prosecution and being held to account so long as they said they were standing against communism. That phenomenon was critically important for many of us. Those of us who have seen teen gods holding on to power and always accounting for it on the basis that they stood against communist insurrection and always getting away with it, were very happy to see that communism as an ideological threat to democracy was not there anymore. And it easily translated into successes, including in my own country, that we could use popular action to force a return to multi-party democracy. We could see the Mobutu Sesesekos of this world driven out of office and dying in exile. And all manner of cases of teen gods who had been using the excuse of the Cold War to retain power giving way. Uh, secondly, in the wake of Berlin, the spirit of multilateral solutions to global problems gained more strength than at any time since the creation of the Bretton Woods institutions. I mean, at the end of the World War, two, three things demonstrated a shared sense that global solutions needed global, uh, global challenges needed global solutions. One, the Bank of Reconstruction. Two, the creation of the United Nations. And three, the creation of the World Bank and IMF a clear statement on internationalizing solutions to identified problems and creating international platforms for collectively dealing with challenges and experience. Since that period, there was never much effort in uh, replenishing internationalism until the period after the collapse of the Berlin Wall when we see a rewriting of the architecture of international trade. That since the 1940s from Havana, Cuba, it had been that a club of a few could sit together under God's rules, <coughs> agree on the rules of the game, and impose on the rest of the world. But it's in the wake of uh, the reunification of Germany, at the heart of Europe, a sense that a rules-based international trading system 
should be founded on democratic engagement between all member states that pass the basic entry point. And a global belief that a rules-based liberalized market system will be a liberative force even for poor countries to gain internationally. That is why from Marrakesh to Uruguay, the establishment of the World Trade Organization did not meet any headwinds against global collaboration on rulemaking. And that is why it was built into the rulemaking that there will be affirmative action, preferential commitments, preferential arrangements for the most vulnerable countries. So that is one phenomenon that was happening that has, been, that has served the world well, but it has hid headwinds in the recent past, and I'll come back to this in a moment. The second, which is very directly related to the multilateralist experience, is globalization. That in the period since the end of the 1990s, a phenomenal belief that if you open up markets beyond national boundaries, anchored on agreed rules, rules being created under the WTO system with the appellate institution to, to preside over any conflicts and disputes, that you will be able to not only integrate enterprises and peoples, but that you will unleash a new capitalism where enterprise benefits from efficiencies regardless of their geography. This was aided by the revolution of the container, the revolution of trucking, and the low cost of maritime transport, which means that you could ship around a product to four or five different destinations for addition of values, value. And if you look at it globally, the measure of internationalized production in a product is called uh, foreign value added. From 1990 to the year 2008, there was a steady increase in foreign value added in every exported product and service. By the financial crisis in 2008, globally, 31% of the value of an average product represented international cooperation beyond national territory. After, this, after the 20, 2008, there has been a steady decline, and the most rapid decline in globalized production is happening in the past two to three years. Uh, another positive that was happening that we build globally a momentum that started working on the basis of shared values instead of fearing others. For we had lived in a phase where fear was a driver of action. Now this has its strength, but it also has its weaknesses. And I think this is part of the challenge that I want to, to share in my sense of the challenges that we face in the world today. When you have a privilege, when you have a right, when you have a convenience that is inherited from one generation to another without major challenges of earning it, you take it for granted. The children of affluence can only have intellectual engagement with poverty. And when the generation that suffered the vagaries of the post-war period give, give pace or retire, disappear, and the next generations of booming, explosive economic prosperity come, they only hear about what it was like when times were difficult. And therefore, unless there's purposeful action, they rarely think of the need to be rallied, to stand up to defend the gains that have been achieved. I listened this morning about uh, how will you, how will we regain impetus about the importance of the European project. I think there are very many opportunities coming your way. One of them is when you look at England, what happens if they get out of the project? You will have the best empirical evidence of whether you have benefited or not benefited. I was discussing with colleagues in Geneva a few months ago, and I said, maybe Europe should suspend the Schengen rule for a few months. Just let today's generation know the inconveniences of applying for visas and movement, which they have taken for granted. Because they have come to experience the benefits of integration without the sacrifices that bring it to them. 
and then they take the benefits for granted. But unfortunately, we should never experiment with pain in order to know the value of peace. And that's the challenge. But there's another challenge that I think is significant. The assumptions of globalization were that if we free the movement of goods and services beyond national borders and create global jurisdiction that encourages globalized, decentralized production and consumption, it will benefit everybody. There's a problem with that. There's a libertarian sense that the marketplace fixes problems on its own. And one of the consequences is areas of extreme competitiveness started eroding the confidence and comfort of areas of less competitiveness. Now, instead of addressing the challenge of declining competitiveness, you will define it out of fear. will be overrun by those who appear to be manipulating the rules for their benefit. There is another phenomenon that has forced its way onto us, which started in 1998, when President Clinton declared that for the, for the first time since the Second World War, since the Communist Revolution in China, that U.S. did not consider China an enemy anymore. They were now going to be strategic partners. It's not because it had been a miracle overnight. To many of us, what had happened is this, that American strategic thinking looked at the collapse of communism in Europe as evidence that if you allow people to see the miracles of the marketplace and the benefits of capitalism, you manufacture a middle class and middle class appetites, which are the grave diggers of communism. So if we bring in China from the cold and we start creating a middle class in China, those are going to be the grave diggers of communism in China. And that's why America not only encouraged but facilitated a very generous entry of the, uh, China into WTO. There are many countries which spend today 10 years being asked all manner of things. Abolish state enterprises, open up your domestic market, telecoms market, liberalize your financial services before you join WTO. Even very weak and vulnerable countries. China kept most of this and was still allowed within three years from the Clinton statement to become a member of WTO in 2001. So the expectation was that you unleash capitalism to China and the middle class will lead to the grumbling of communism in China. Fast forward 20 years, and what do we see? The capitalist experiment in China has been a miraculous success. Today, China has the largest number of millionaires in the world, more than any place in the world. The largest trading economy in the world, the second largest economy in the world. But what has happened is that unlike Eastern Europe, the Communist Party of China reformed itself to become stronger on the basis of stronger capitalism. And it's precisely because of the, the synergies between the growth of private enterprise in China and the growth of the Communist Party that all of a sudden the threat of a technical competition from China becomes a challenge. Uh, the rest is history. There's a technology called war that is clouding even the discourse about international cooperation, about globalization, about rule-based trade disputes and trade engagement. As a, a Chinese minister was saying at a forum I attended in Shanghai early this week at the import fair in Shanghai, said, we looked forward to join the world in a trade-based development that helps everybody. But now we're in a situation where we're being asked, if you want to sell to us, you must buy even more soybean than we can produce. And how can we have a rule-based system where one country demands that you buy a specific product from me before you have access to my market in other areas? Okay, those are challenges that we'll be dealing with. But I think the important thing is twofold. One, the tensions between China and the U.S. that we see today are not about to go away. They are not short-term populist tensions. Trump may put it in a certain way, but there are challenges that were rising for some time, and I think they will supersede the tenure of President Trump. But secondly, the way the world deals with those challenges has been defective. 
One of the critical deficiencies of our global response to the rising tension between China and the US is the absence of political intellectual leadership from Europe. Historically, Europe has been a better of a reasoned way of dealing with global challenges, both in the experience of the European project, in the experience of how it invested in reconfiguring Europe after the collapse of communism, and in the way it has related with development challenges globally. But you know, you are going through a season of low provision of intellectual leadership in European politics. That there are no giants of European state politics who get the world to listen to them, who can say there is a better way of us sorting out this matter like the way we are doing, who can restate the value of shared norms of human dignity, of playing by the rules, of fair play. This, I think, is a phenomenon that both ref affects the growing popularity of populist political entities, but also the absence of significant political statements reinstating, restating the importance of multilateralism, restating that a rules-based system is the best solution to all of us. You are seeing the crisis we're having with climate change, that in the absence of political unanimity, we even suppress restating the scientifically evident truth that we are living through dangerous times and that we have very limited options, limited window for correcting the direction the world is going. It is most painfully felt in small island economies, in low-lying uh, maritime uh, regions of the world, coastal communities. But the urges that it will get politically is not coming through. Uh, I could go a long way on that, but I think I want to, to just turn on to two, three things and say, uh, what are the new solutions? What are the possibilities that will get worse? What are the new opportunities for new worlds? Globalization has brought us together, but globalization to be sustainable requires that we address the dis distortions, the unequal benefit from global engagement through active policy and instruments of solidarity. It also requires that there is political statement that there are certain values that are important to the world. To me, one of the, if we look back to the to the, this period in the future, one of the things we'll regret is that we're decoupling human rights and human dignity from economic development. The voice of Europe was always critical in holding countries like China to account about evolving human dignity. The experiment of the fall of the wall coming a few months after Tiananmen Square was very poignant for many of us about how you can deal with pressures for change. At the European experiment is not countering the voices of mind your business. And we don't see very many others that can do better than a united Europe that restates the values of human dignity, the values of inclusivity, the values of diversity. There is another area of potential new walls that I wanted to talk about. One is a bi bi one level you can say that even in within countries, you know, one of the interesting things about what's happening in America is uh, coastal America could be in Venice and the mid mi Midwest will be on, on, on Mars. That there's such a difference in what they see as their real challenges, what they see as their opportunities, what they see as the base of their identity such that when you're in California or New York, you hear people saying, I'd rather not f drive through that country. I'd rather just fly to get to California or to New York without going through this uh, uh, very nativist territory. But I don't think it's just an American phenomenon because I was looking at what has been happening in Eastern Europe over the past few days, that the countries which have seen a drift towards illiberal leadership, Hungary, Poland, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, have recently been having local elections. And in all of those countries, non-nativist opposition leaders have won the mayoral elections in all the main capitals. 
If you look at it recently, Hungary, Poland, Slovakia, Czech Republic, all of them have just had a more internationalist team of players, both from the left and the right, taking over the leadership of the capitals. So you are seeing the emergence of a possible more internationally uh, responsive uh, urban populations and more nativist populations in the interiors of the same country. Just like it's in America, you start seeing it in some parts of Europe. How will we tear down those polarizing walls that can potentially lead to very, very substantial strife and dissipating of energies of national and international action? Another area that I think is of significant tension and with totally different dynamics is the rising digital economy. A few months ago, we just uh, launched the digital economic report, economy report, the world global report on uh, the digital economy. And the number of statistics are very interesting. While in the past few years we've been looking at China and US as competing, we have taken the eye off the ball that China and the US are running away with the digital economy. Of the, let me just share a few statistics. Of the 70 largest digital platform giant companies in the world by capitalization, 90% of them are either American or Chinese. 75% of the global market for cloud computing is either Chinese or American. 75% of the global applications for patents on blockchain technology are either Chinese or American. 78% of all applications for patents in the Internet of Things are American, Chinese, and Japanese. Among the digital giants in capitalization, Korea has more value than the entire European Union put together. At 3.8%, Europe is 36 I mean, this is a one of the few cases where Europe is more like Africa. <laughs> and the, 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 the challenge is how do we create the ecosystem to break the kind of concentration and consolidation that is happening? How do we find methods of stopping, for example, uh, the big giants that when you have any innovative idea, they come and buy it, just like happened with Skype, with, uh, with, uh, with, with WhatsApp, that they don't need to generate the research and development. They come and buy whatever has been produced. These are realities and challenges that have to come into the discourse because an unequal development of the digital economy can be the basis of new strife and tensions. We were just sharing one example recently that 66% 6, 6 of the net revenues of American <coughs> digital giants are under broad, but 90% of their taxes are paid in the US. And most of the 10% remaining is actually paid in Ireland, not in the rest of the world. So we, we, we are coming into the phenomenon of uh, the fourth industrial revolution represents opportunities for and enablers for inclusive prosperity, for new livelihoods. But if most of the world are consumers of the content of a few and not creators of value, not exporters of services, that is not a model of sustainable engagement. And I want to express my appreciation to European Union because they have laid the way on rethinking taxation policy in the digital era. They have been world leaders in trying to discipline and regulate the conduct of multinational, I mean, uh, multinational enterprises in the digital economy, more than other areas. But there's need for more global engagement. There's need for more positive discourse that we belong together and many of the solutions that are sustainable and viable require solidarity, mutual respect, and multilateral engagement that we're going to be able to say the spirit that led the non-Germans to celebrate the fall of the wall of Berlin is realized again in global engagement. Thank you for your attention.
thank you so much, sir. My name is Ahmed. Um, I wanted to ask you, since since you talked about globalization, I wanted to ask you, how important do you think it is on developing economies, specifically ones that are still growing and still have a long time, and that import high import uh, impose I'm sorry impose high import tariffs on it? Do you think globalization would help to the growing of that economy, or would would just act act against it? Thank you. Okay, um, all right. Thank you so much. I appreciate ICD's opportunity to talk and have discussions with such important people. Uh, and in particular, uh, the conference on trade and development is, is an amazing intermediate actor for bringing the, the voices and demands of the global south into the big decision-making tables of the G20, for instance. So it's super important, this role here. I would please uh, respectfully, respectfully well, ask you to address three topics that maybe the, uh, the conference is already uh, thinking about bringing in, uh, which first is speaking the truth and like disseminating the idea that really protectionism and uh, subsidies are really uh, huge enemies f uh, for, for trade, the growth of trade and, and, and for therefore for also development. And bringing the truth will imply also to advance in science and disseminate uh, the, what, what's new about the, the knowledge about trade because nowadays people continue seeing globalization as, a, as imperialism or continue seeing the world's trade as, uh, as within an div international division of labor instead of global production, uh, global value chains and, and um, also value added and so on. So uh, speaking the truth is part of this problem as well. This is related to trade. And the second is related to uh, how to finance and how to build infrastructure projects. So China has a Belt and Road Initiative and there's nothing like a Marshall Plan or, or something like it coming from other actors. Besides China, there isn't anything. Not the European Union, no other alternative for countries which need, uh, desperately need infrastructure. And this, uh, so the conference could bring this in as well, like trying to di have a dialogue with the Chinese projects and make something like a Global South project of integrating infrastructure. And how to finance that is the third part, the third topic I, I promise to bring and would respectfully ask you to address. The third one is like where to bring money. So there are very rich safe havens in the world and the tax evasion everywhere and we are talking about trillions of dollars which either the IMF or the Conference on Trade and, Deve and Development, they don't they are they aren't able to track. There is no data about where um, it direct foreign investments come from and go to. The the origins and destinations they are very uh, opaque. It's very. Uh, Can you make it short and clear, straight? Yeah, sure. What do you want to ask about FFDR? Yeah. So, um, how would the conference address this issue? Like trying to. Um, get the money that, that it comes from tracks evasion and, and is um, uh, based on safe havens and try to promote a way of financing infrastructure projects and speaking the truth about global trade. That's right. Just uh, one more question. Uh, I would like to pose uh, from the opposite uh, end, more or less. Uh, now there are some who have serious doubts about the marketization of the world. And uh, of course, that was one of the reasons why the Doha round of the WTO stranded. Then the richest nations in the world, including the European Union, uh, they, behind closed doors, started on the TISA round. And we had the TTIPs and these uh, uh, separate developments. Uh, how, how do you see that development? 
what is the future of the WTO uh, experiment in that context? Now, these are questions from different angles, but yeah, yeah. please, sir. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Um, the first question about high tariffs. The history of the world has shown us all that the historical moment when a country could industrialize on the basis of high tariffs ended, ended about two decades ago. There is no country which is developing on the basis of high tariffs anymore. Reason? for emerging economies, the main niche in global value chains, the main opportunity for value addition is to be able to be part of a, a network of production and sell and, and, and marketing. You cannot do that if you erect high tariffs around your territory. There is no large enough economy re remaining out there which can grow an internal market without depending on international engagement. So the model of high tariff industrialization, which was used earlier by India and China, for example, is out of the question in today's world. On the question of protectionism, there are a number of different things. I can say this for a long time. The gentleman from Brazil, globalization as imperialism was the argument of developing countries 20 years ago. Today. They are the main defenders of globalization. They are the main defenders of multilateralism. They are saying, we feared to be overrun, but it has taught us to become more competitive by addressing our weaknesses. The main opponents of globalization are not in the global south today. They are in the global north. And I don't think America can complain that there is an imperialism coming out of Brazil and Africa. So uh, that was, that's, there has been a flip of uh, who sees globalization as foreign invasion in us. On the question of new science, new science has a lot of things. I, I, if I two hours, I'll talk about it. I can give an example that I, we were discussing with President Sarkassian of Armenia, which is the threatened disappearance of the boundary between the virtual and the real. Now that traditionally, the virtual, whether it is cinema, or other art forms was an imitation of reality. But the boundary between acting the world and the real world has so disappeared that it is directly impacting how people choose leaders. You've seen how a person who has created a career pretending to be a president became a president in Ukraine. And similarly, we, we, we are seeing the rise of certain populism is actually the work of the digital media and social media in collapsing the boundaries between the virtual and the real, whether it's American populism or some parts of European populism. In sport, we have seen what? It, there used to be, when I grew up, the main soccer was what was played in the pitch, and we went and paid to go to the stadium to see, or we watched it on television. Then they started coming up football and virtual football where people sit behind a computer and playing games like football online. Many of you may not know, but today the market of virtual football is more than four times the market of real football. There is more money in computer games of football than in actual football that happens in the soccer pitch. So this is the, the impact of a virtual reality collapsing the boundary with the reality, the real world. And the ramifications of this are still out there. We've just been having a discussion of what is the impact of artificial intelligence? Where is it going? Today, in diagnostic science, artificial intelligence, including uh, what's called uh, the deep intelligence, uh, um, neurotic networks, are smarter than humans in forensic medicine, in putting together data to s identify, to predict. Already AI is stronger than humans in predictive work. We only beat AI because of our judgment and our ability to make decisions even in the absence of facts. So these, these are realities that will say, how, how will they impact the future we are going to with its uncertainties? Now on the question of uh, infrastructure and fi for financing for development, by the way, the largest amount of money in the world are not in tax havens. They are in the open accounts 
of sovereign funds. Norwegian sovereign fund has $1 trillion in pension funds and other institutional investors. The challenges to globalization with a weak recovery since the financial crisis and the rising populist politics that is disrupting predictable rule making have dampened FDI flows, making institutional investors ready to put money in equities that even had negative interest than to go out and invest like in financing and sustainable development. This is why we're discussing how can we de-risk uh, institutional investments, what it goes into the sectors we need it to go into. Uh, it is not in, in hiding in, uh, in, in harvest, as you mentioned. Uh, if I come to WTO, WTO's crisis is twofold. At one level, related to the Cold War that has now come to us, is a sense that is not just American, it's even shared in Europe that China has benefited from preferences it was given at entry, but it's now too big a player internationally to continue enjoying the same preferences. That some of the preferences it should leave to the Burundis and the Myanmar's of this world and move on to take on some larger responsibilities. And others who are saying China still has some of the largest populations of poor people that need to be showed up. And if you start opening this about removing preferences, when will you close the door? Next will be put in India, put in South Africa, put in Brazil, and before you see it, they're knocking on the doors of other emerging economies. So that is polarizing the WTO. But there's a second thing that is actually even more fundamental. Some important players in the multilateral rule-based trade system are deliberately trying to undermine multilateralism. <coughs> because they believe that it's less costly for them and they get better results for themselves if the rules are negotiated bilaterally or plurilaterally and you use WTO as a registry of agreement. So you only go to WTO to record what you have agreed. That way you cut down noisy developing countries which are punching beyond their weight. And similarly, if you destroy the appellate body and the arbitration, the dispute adjudication at WTO, then you do like what is being done on investment. In the absence of international juris jurisprudence, you domesticate resolutions in American courts. I think these are some of the challenges to WTO. One more Thank you so much. Um, thank you so, mu uh, so much for the presentation. Um, sir, I emulate you, uh, <laughs> considering we also come from the same country. Uh -huh. um, I, I want to use the European Union as a very good example that Africa can use, considering it's one uh, economic you know, block. The, one of the problems that we have in Africa is that there are so many uh, or a number of uh, regional economic blocks, and we are not actually, uh, to a large extent, trading with each with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, one because of the overlapping membership and um, production to a large extent of the same yeah. uh, products. Mm -hmm. um, now I know that UNCTAD has um, a plan to to increase African trade among themselves <laughs> among the African countries uh, by 2040. Um, what is your plan or what would you advise um, us to do um, to increase trade among ourselves and with respect to cultural diplomacy and our Africanness, our identity, our, you know, our, uh, our cultures, mm. um, how the, like how the European Union has done? Thank you. Uh, okay, I'll just uh, take the first part here. There are some things that Africa has emulated Europe, but there are some things that Europe has emulated Africa. The things that uh, Europe has emulated Africa is uh, most recent. The presidents of the East African community countries at a summit give the telecom companies two years 
to abolish roaming charges within the community. Half a year after that came into force, the European Union also gave a moratorium, I mean, a, a deadline for removal of internal roaming charges. So it's not always imitating the other way. But I think one of the most exciting things is that at a time when there are some people are questioning the rationality of the European project, some even struggling to get away, Africa is actually working towards a European-like project. The continental free trade area signed so far by 54 out of 55 countries with some already, most, more than half already ratified, is a statement of belief in a joint initiative, in integration, in strengthening regional solidarity, in cross-border investment and, 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 and services flows. So th 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 that's important. Uh, to my mind, the presence of small experiments at regional integration is not negating a larger project because I worked on the Customs Union for East Africa when I was minister, and the key of the East African community has been the backbone of the continental free trade area in their, 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 their tariff negotiations. So the learning experience through opening to your neighbors allows for more experimentation with opening with more neighbors and expanding the project. On the culture side, I'm afraid I'm inadequate to quite even get to the question, let alone attempt to answer it.